um, so it's, it's been fun and uh, I'm sorry it's going to be over, but uh, it's, I, I learned a lot so far. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot everyone for sticking around. Uh, to the, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, the quantum aspects of black holes uh, in, this, in, in, in this talk uh, for the next hour or so. And I think the timing is good. I had to change it because I had a flight coming up very soon. So I had to change the, the switch the, uh, the order of the talks with the, with the next one. And, uh, uh, but it's good that that's right after Elisa's talk, which so that the topics actually match a lot. Uh, Elisa did talk uh, about uh, the phenomenological aspects of uh, testing horizonless structures. And I'm gonna talk uh, somewhat about the th theoretical uh, motivations of doing that, but also about the observational aspect. Uh, and don't hesitate to interrupt me either on, in the chat or if you if you want, you can just ask questions. Um, so uh, just unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay. So what what, what is the what is the idea? So it's uh, what I want to highlight for you is that uh, idea of testing Einstein's theory is really not uh, very well founded in a sense that there are really two of Einstein's theories. There's quantum mechanics. That was, I mean, Einstein actually won the Nobel Prize for, uh, he didn't win it for relativity, he won it for quantum mechanics. And then there is the theory of relativity. And interestingly, uh, these are two papers that I'd like to highlight here. There is uh, one from uh, July uh, 1916. And then uh, that was the uh, theory of stimulated and uh, it's quantum radiation basically stimulated and a spontaneous emission and absorption. Uh, and then from 1915 in November, that was basically Einstein celebrated uh, questions of general relativity. And they were just within the span of seven months, uh, right in the middle of uh, the First World War, uh, which is. Um, uh, well, it's actually highlights, given the, the times that English we live in, it, it also highlights how the science lives on, but the wars come and go. Uh, but then there are some wars that actually stay with us. And in particular, this war is in fact the inherent conflict between these two thoughts that have been going on in Einstein's mind at the same time. Uh, the nature of quantum radiation, uh, and this one's something you all learn in um, kindergarten, actually, uh, which is there is um, a stimulated and a spontaneous emission, which is in equilibrium with absorption in thermal, if you have a thermal bath at the right temperature. And from this, basically, you could derive a um, Boltzmann relationship with uh, the Boltzmann ratio of excited state to, to uh, less excited state, basically. This is the Boltzmann ratio that we all learn in kindergarten. Uh, and of course, on the right hand side, you have Einstein's relativity, as we've been hearing about for the past uh, four days, and I've, I mean, which is uh, celebrated and now most, most recently gravitational waves have been detected uh, from uh, as one of the predictions of the theory. So these two thoughts have both been going on in Einstein's mind at the same time. And of course, both have grown to make much of modern physics as we know it. On the left, quantum radiation, and in particular, Bose, Bose Einstein. Uh, well, there, there is uh, uh, Bose Einstein statistics um, and um, su uh, superconductors, superfluids, um, uh, lasers. All of these are basically based on what Einstein developed originally as quantum radiation. And uh, of course, won several Nobel Prizes and at the heart of quantum mechanics. And on the right, we have uh, black holes that have been observed to deaths now, and then won Nobel Prizes for gravitational waves, and then evidence for the black hole at the center of our galaxy, uh, 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 Penrose's mathematical work. So they are both have basically, both of these developments, both are starting within, the, within those seven months. Uh, are really foundations of physics as we know it. And they all go basically back, uh, go back to what Einstein was thinking during that seven month period. However, as you can anticipate, there is an inherent conflict in between those two ideas. And I'm gonna kind of try to explore how deep those conflicts are and how apparent the resolution of the conflict must be. So, as you might have already guessed, 
this is about black holes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about black holes in the gravitational theory. Uh, so uh, what, what Einstein did in his first paper in 1915. And then I'm going to uh, try to uh, look at the same thing in quantum theory, basically what he did in his second paper in quantum radiation, and then try to put them together and see how the two pictures can match, or if the two pictures can ever match. But let's just start with the things that we know. Uh, so this is a numerical simulation of two merging neutron stars in the Einstein's theory of relativity. At the end, they, uh, they merge and form a black hole. Uh, this is a simulation from 2013. And of course, the black hole, this, uh, the merger was, uh, this very process was observed in 2017. Uh, the uh, celebrated LIGO event 1708-17 that was observed both electromagnetically by 15% of astronomers across the world and of course by LIGO. Um, so uh, that's of course celebrated result of Einstein's uh, theory and, uh, and it confirmed um, formation of black holes. Although I mean, I guess there is some controversy about whether black holes does form, but most, most uh, seem to think that black holes do form at the uh, end of this event. And Einstein's predict, and we know this establishes mathematically that when you form trapped uh, uh, surfaces and uh, have ordinary matter, that leads to formation of singularities and event horizons. So event horizons are regions which uh, uh, separate ordinary space where you can in principle escape to infinity and places where you have no possible uh, uh, eventuality other than being crushed by a singularity according to Einstein's theory. However, there is something that's uh, also foundational to Einstein's theory as far as we can tell, uh, which is horizons, even though they have a global significance, they locally have no significance. If you cross them, you don't notice anything in Einstein's theory. So the, this, this is known as no drama. Of course, building upon this, we know I, uh, that there has been a lot of developments. In particular, there is a curious the case of black hole thermodynamics that uh, Hawking and collaborators developed, uh, that it seems that black holes, even though they seem to be classical in Einstein's theory, because it's a classical theory, they seem to have a temperature. Uh, this uh, you can get from quantum field theory in classical space time. They seem to have an entropy and they obey laws of thermodynamics. The big puzzle that uh, have we've been uh, struggling to so uh, resolve for the past uh, 40 years or so is that what the states are counted by this entropy? Is the entropy that uh, Bekenesing and Hawking propose area of horizon divided by 4G? Does it actually count as states the same way that uh, we think thermodynamic entropy in other systems, uh, other quantum systems, in fact, works? Uh, and another prediction, which is kind of mainstream, is that black holes, if they are small enough, or if they are, if you wait long enough, they're going to explode. Uh, and this is, uh, this is again, this is just kind of a cartoon of that. And uh, they get hotter and hotter, and then eventually just explode. So these are all a standard textbook thing, a textbook uh, material you can find in, again, in your kindergarten uh, books. Uh, but then there is a catch, and that catch has to do with this other thing that Einstein was thinking about, uh, which has to do with quantum radiation or quantum theory of radiation, also in German. So, so all of these important papers were in German indeed. So there is something wrong with these stories I told you with the stories we learned in kindergarten. Uh, the first one was, in fact, pointed out by Stephen Hawking himself. It's known as information paradox. And it seems that basically unitary black hole evaporation is not consistent with uh, local physics and a smooth horizon. So if you want to go by the letter of general relativity and uh, stick to a smooth horizon, it looks like an information that falls into a black hole is lost. And at most recently, this was revived in the form of the hot fireball paradox uh, that's known as AMPS. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. So this is the most famous problem, but there are, there are less, slightly less famous ones that uh, nevertheless, are, I think, are very important. One is due to Samir Masur, uh, 
uh, which is known as quantum tunneling. So you would think for big macroscopic objects, quantum tunneling is a small, uh, and indeed it is a small, it's suppressed by some large, by some tiny exponential of what's known as Euclidean action. But if you think black holes have large entropies, they have a lot of quantum states that you could tunnel to. And the product of these two, in fact, is a order one. So if a star collapses into a black hole or crosses its, uh, its horizon, in fact, has order one probability of tunneling to one of these microscopes. So the idea that quantum gravity is not important, in fact, is something that came up in one of the questions. That's the semi-classical argument that ignores quantum tunneling. But uh, a fully quantum argument suggests that uh, you cannot use a semi-classical argument as soon as horizon form if you believe that black holes have entropy. Of course, if you don't believe black holes have entropy, then that's a different story. Uh, but if you take the entropy of black holes seriously, as soon as you form the horizon, the classical picture completely breaks down. Uh, a yet third motivation, which is uh, even less known, but is one that in fact got me into this is, is, is how you can explain the scale of dark energy by uh, coupling black holes to dark energy. Uh, uh, this removes a horizon, but can actually explain the scale of dark energy as is observed. So I think this is an interesting motivation, but there hasn't been much progress made towards it. So I'm not gonna talk much more about this uh, through for the rest of the talk. So these are some motivations for why the story that you learn in kindergarten about black holes may not be quite right. In particular, the one that's kind of more, more recent in everyone's memory is known, known as Firewall Paradox, that these, uh, to be more precise, but these gentlemen claim uh, that collectively known as AMPS these days, but also Samir Matur had a version of this earlier, right, in, back in 2008, that these four uh, principles that are assumed uh, usually in mainstream uh, to be correct, unitarity of quantum mechanics, no drama at the horizon, quantum field theory, standard quantum field theory outside black holes, and then the, the basically the area law, they are inconsistent and they claim that the best, uh, the most conservative way of solving it is to get, in, to get rid of no drama, what they call fireball. So basically there is drama at the horizon. When observer falls through the horizon, they're gonna feel something. Okay. The nature of drama is yet to be decided, but that's, that was their proposal. Notice that this is not a model. It just says that uh, these four cannot be correct. So it is really a paradox and then the other, uh, other researchers uh, have other, uh, basically other assumptions that they prefer to break. For example, some may say quantum mechanics is not unitary. Other may say that black hole, the area law is not really counting the number of states in the Hilbert space. So there is there is more than, I mean, for example, Steve Giddings thinks that maybe you have non-locality. So quantum field theory even outside horizon is not correct. So there are different ways of solving this. Uh, firewall is in, in some sense is maybe the most concerning. So, uh, so I started to mention, okay, so now we know what fireball is not. So it's not a standard general activity. What they could be that it is model dependent. And we've heard from Elisa's talk, there are some of the ideas for the models in play. I thought I mentioned one because we just posted this uh, last week. Um, or was it this week? I think it's actually, yeah. So 10 days ago, uh, it appeared on Monday. And it's based on a model of quantum gravity or approach to quantum gravity known as asymptotic safety, which suggests that there's a non-trivial UV fixed point in the theory of um, uh, gravity. And it makes all the couplings uh, run with the renormalization group, uh, which is uh, basically what you expect from quantum radiative corrections. And we, we, we looked at the particular toy model for asymptotic safety and assume that the scale of renormalization is a, is a local or Tolman temperature. And we found that what it does is that it, it gets rid of the horizons. Basically, when the temperature starts to blow up near the horizon, then, then in fact, the, the modifications become important and they give you a, a scale invariant and conformal, or conformal, you may uh, say, core. So outside, you just have short shield, but inside you have this, this power law behavior, which uh, becomes, um, deeper and deeper. So basically the redshift becomes bigger and bigger for bigger and bigger black holes, but it's always finite. Doesn't go, G00 doesn't go to zero at the horizon. 
In fact, there is no horizon in this in this particular model. So, so that's one way to do this. Uh, is uh, but basically to understand, you need a you need a theory of quantum gravity to understand what's happening, right? And the one possibility is asymptotic safety. Another is a string theory. Uh, so there's a question by Sayak. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the last slide, I had the question. Uh, yes. You said that the horizon disappears. So my question is, what happens to the causal structure then? It, it's basically like a neutrino star, but it's just a very compact neutrino star. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Other questions? Okay. Well, let me move on then. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Very good. Um, so uh, another possibility is fuzzballs in a string theory. Of course, a string theory is a is a is a much more uh, developed theory of quantum gravity. However, it is also a much harder framework. And um, uh, in fact, um, what I did present to you is also a toy model. So uh, fuzzballs are supposed to be much more. Um, uh, realistic, although the problem with them, uh, so even though a string theory is much more developed, everything is also much harder. So the, the fuzzball uh, solutions that we have for black holes are all also toy models. They're not generic fuzzballs, but they're kind of a special fuzzball solutions. Uh, and basically you replace again the, the causal structure with some quantum structure, which doesn't have any horizon or singularity. It typically have higher dimensions and have basically charges and fluxes inside of it. Uh, and we do have access, we can construct some special solutions of these, but there should be basically exponential of the entropy, many of these, and then the generic ones are hard to construct. Uh, they do have Hawking radiation, but because they don't have horizon, Hawking radiation in fact happens uh, in ergo regions in these fuzzball solutions. So they are basically just geometric metric uh, solutions, they're just metrics, and they do have ergo regions, some of them at least. Uh, so that's how you could get uh, emissions out of them. So this is another possibility. Unfortunately, because they are complex, it's hard to do explicit calculations. I'm going to show you an example, but they're not um, they're not typical fuzzball solutions. They're kind of a special ones. Now, uh, if you don't have any of these deviations from a standard uh, GR picture, in particular, if you get rid of the horizon, then you expect a generic prediction, and you've already heard that, so it wouldn't be a surprise to you. You already heard from uh, Elisa about uh, what they are. They are known as echoes. So in fact, we first called them echoes from the abyss. Uh, and we, uh, you could basically, basically the picture is on here I, on, on the right, I have a cartoon for you. This is a, it's what's known as a tortoise coordinate, or radial coordinate, and then time. And what happens is that uh, you could get uh, gravitational waves that are stuck between this quantum structure uh, or a fuzzball and the classical angular momentum barrier. So things like that are stuck, uh, bounce back and forth. Every, every, once, uh, every time they bounce off of the angular momentum barrier, they're going to get an echo. And you've already heard uh, from some of the speakers about this. The time scale, if you imagine this is quantum structure or Planckian structure, is of order a second for LIGO like events. And this is basically the exact formula. There's a specific dependence on the mass and the spin. Um, and uh, there's a logarithmic uh, enhancement, uh, which basically makes the echoes uh, separate parametrically from the main GR event. So this is an example of how it looks like for the first gravitational wave event, as we've seen. Um, and that's nice, basically, because uh, then you don't. Uh, so this is smoking gun because uh, you should fit GR basically uh, to a good degree, and wait for a while. And when you see a signal, which then presumably repeats, that's going to be a smoking gun for these near horizon structures. So, uh, so that's kind of the picture. So you have this. Uh, you see the GR event, and then for a while you don't see anything, and then as Bitter and Elisa have shown, you're gonna see or you're gonna hear echoes. And for this, is gonna be 0.3 second for this event. For other events, this could be a longer or shorter. So, the next question is: Okay, so what you're gonna hear? So, I told you when you're gonna hear something. Uh, but then what you're gonna hear is another question, which is model dependent. 
But what has become, I think, clear to me and, and collaborators is, in fact, there's a variety of arguments that tells you that if you believe, if you take quantum mechanics seriously, there is one universal prediction for what you come out. And um, it seems that, I mean, there are assumptions, but uh, it seems that there are so many ways that this comes out, it's kind of hard to see how you could modify it in a theory that respects quantum mechanics. And I should say that basically quantum mechanics, if you just start from first principle, it's very hard to get around this. So, um, so we first got this from something like a, from fluctuation dissipation theorem. Uh, then we reproduce this. And what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here is reflectivity of the horizon. So this R is reflectivity. Uh, and it basically tells you what fraction of energy that hits the horizon can be reflected. Uh, in general, relativity is zero. And what, what I'm proposing, and we have basically proof for it from these various arguments, that it goes as a Boltzmann factor. So for high frequencies, in fact, it looks just like general relativity, which is uh, consistent with what Samir Matur calls, uh, calls fuzzball complementarity. But at low frequencies, you could have significant, uh, significant reflection. Um, so basically, we have five different arguments for this. And I'm going to tell you briefly uh, where these arguments come from without giving you too much detail. But uh, the prediction uh, uh, of this model is that you're going to get echoes uh, as a stimulated Hawking radiation. Basically, uh, incoming gravitational waves can stimulate Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is generally weak for large black holes, but they can be stimulated by incoming radiation. Uh, and you're going to see that the maximum at the time that I told you, uh, which is logarithmically delayed, and the maximum fre horizon frequency, basically. So if you have a spinning black hole, uh, if you have a non-spinning black hole, most of the reflection is at zero frequency. But for a spinning black hole, you should go to the rest frame of the horizon. So maximum reflection happens at the frequency, which is the, matches the horizon frequency, uh, or m omega h. So these are kind of the cartoon of the arguments, basically. If you try to turn off um, dissipation in some medium, it turns out, in fact, if you maximize the dissipation, you get reflectivity. And that's just the nature of the wave propagation. If you have something that happens, even if it's dissipative, but if it happens in a, uh, in a spatially dependent way, then it's going to lead to reflection. And here I'm just uh, tuning up uh, the reflectivity, sorry, the dissipation in this medium. And in fact, you see that maximum dissipation gives you maximum reflectivity, it turns out. And this is just the nature of wave equation because you violate the WKB approximation. And if you do it for black hole space time, this gives you uh, the, the Boltzmann reflectivity. Uh, when we first got that, then we thought there must be a reason. And in fact, it turns out you could just do it from, go back to Einstein's paper from 1916, uh, where he had uh, basically derived a, a stimulated emission, uh, a spontaneous emission, and then, sorry, a stimulated emission, a spontaneous emission and absorption. Uh, so you can just basically take this picture that Einstein developed and uh, assume that a spontaneous emission is Hawking radiation, which is what, in fact, anybody who takes quantum black hole seriously believes. Um, and then say that, okay, now imagine putting this uh, system in a thermal bath. Now, if the temperature is Hawking temperature, then they, 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 all these processes should cancel each other, as Einstein suggested. However, if the incident radiation is not Hawking temperature, but it's much, much uh, stronger, like we have when two black holes merge, then uh, the, the processes don't cancel. Uh, and you, in fact, a spontaneous emission because Hawking radiation is becomes uh, negligible, but you have uh, a stimulated emission um, and you have absorption. Uh, and a stimulated emission, basically, you, you're going to have much stronger Hawking radiation because you have uh, the this incoming radiation is uh, stimulating the, uh, the transition. And from this, you could, in fact, derive the same thing, which essentially, again, plugging into Einstein's formula in his paper, and you're going to get Boltzmann reflectivity. In fact, the same formula that I showed you earlier. So that's where it comes from. But you could, in fact, uh, find this from elsewhere. Uh, this is a paper by, by Patrick Hayden and Jeff Pennington trying to uh, basically make sense of the quantum properties of black holes uh, in light of um, 
uh, what we know from quantum communication theory, which is a hot topic has been for quantum information applications to black hole. And what they suggest is that uh, you have to modify the horizon significantly. In particular, this is an example of something that satisfies all the expectations from quantum communication theory. This is like a, a eternal black hole cut in half where you identify you have a Z2 quotient of eternal black hole. And if you just take this as space time and then assume Z2 symmetry, you, uh, what it does is it maps ingoing modes to outgoing modes because of this basic reflection symmetry that you put here. And if you look at it in the black hole coordinates, you get exactly the same thing. You get the Boltzmann reflectivity. So, so you get this, these results from completely unrelated reason, basic directions. They all give you the same thing. And all they rely on is essentially um, black hole geometry outside the horizon and some element of quantum mechanics, basically. Right? There could be very different elements of quantum mechanics, but if you take any of these elements of quantum mechanics, basically, uh, they all suggest that there must be an effectivity given by this formula. Uh, so the, we, we had um, uh, another derivation of this. This one, in fact, we, we used uh, for purely classical space time everywhere, but then we did this exercise for photons instead of for gravitons, because uh, quantum electrodynamics is better understood than quantum gravity, obviously. So, uh, and in, in this case, if you just take a, a care of a space time, uh, which is classical, but then you have quantum fields like QED in this background, what happens is that you can make, uh, in fact, a plasma of uh, electron positrons outside the horizon from Hawking radiation. Uh, and this is what we did with Van Zen Chua, who, is a, um, who was a, a student at Parameter, now, uh, now the PhD student at uh, Cornell. Uh, and basically we had two different derivations. One was basically if you had the plasma of Hawking uh, electron positrons outside the horizon, what they do is that in fact, they give photon a mass. So a photon is massless out here, but as soon as it sees this plasma, it becomes massive. And then it, uh, the, the low frequency photons can get reflection. Uh, and then did, we did that calculation based on proper, uh, basically the, the shape of this potential um, that comes from plasma frequency. And then the other calculation we did, we just took the Minkowski uh, one loop uh, propagator and, and projected into Rindler coordinates. And they both are supposed to give you basically what these virtual fluctuations that uh, uh, in Minkowski, they're just virtual, but in, in Rindler, they become real particles. They become this Hawking plasma. Uh, what they do to photons, and they both give you the same thing. They give you reflectivity. Uh, which for photons go as alpha QED as squared, because of course, uh, if there is no interaction, there's nothing happening. So you require interactions, but they also give you a displacement factor. And if you replace alpha QED with alpha gravity, then you, you re reproduce the same formula we had before. With, um, so for photons, just from QED itself, it doesn't give you a lot of reflection because alpha is 1 over 137, which is a small. Uh, but then, of course, gravity is also quantum at some level. So if you want to generalize this formula to include quantum gravity effect, then you would get the same formula we had from previous arguments. So, uh, so these are kind of the range of arguments you have that suggest there should be this Boltzmann reflectivity, which tells you still that Einstein's relativity is very good as long as you're talking about point particles with high frequencies, because you know Hawking temperature, uh, the wavelength uh, for for Hawking photon is very big. So for anything that's a small, this reflectivity is tiny, is exponentially small. You could see, uh, so you don't really care about it. Black holes are black. It's, it's for low frequencies where you have to start worrying about these quantum effects. Uh, now, I wanna say something else about the time scale. It turns out that uh, even though the Boltzmann reflectivity is kind of new, the, the time scale is less new. In fact, this time scale was first suggested by Sakino and Suskin from uh, basic chaotic. If you think uh, black holes are quantum chaotic objects, uh, they propose that this, this time scale, which is logarithmically long, um, is, um, uh, is something you expect from, uh, basically it is the fastest that things can be scrambled in a quantum chaotic system. Um, so this was first proposed by them as, as scrambling time. 
And what my PhD student, Krishan Saraswat, showed, uh, so in fact, it was a very interesting thing to notice, is that in all situations where scrambling time can be calculated uh, in these ADS-CFD uh, prescriptions, in holographic prescriptions, they are the same as the echo time. So they are exactly the same in all situations where they can be calculated. So it seems that, in fact, there is, uh, it's not just the uh, amplitude, and it's not the, just the presence of the echoes that comes from uh, quantum information, but also even the time scale, something that has already been there in literature before. And uh, we could uh, kind of try to make the connections cl uh, clearer. Um, it turns out that uh, not one way of understanding black holes is in terms of random matrices, and even though uh, regular random matrices don't give you echoes, we, we show that, um, in fact, if you, if you uh, look at the statistics of a spacing of these random matrices and then modify it to what's known as beta ensembles, they actually lead, lead to echoes. So this is examples of this is something known as the spectral form factor that people who study uh, quantum black holes uh, look, at, look at a lot. And then you see these echoes in these models. So, um, and then you could look at the spacing of energies uh, or spectra and, and see that what type of uh, spacings in fact lead to echoes. Uh, it's, you cannot prove that this is a generic prediction, but you could also you could tell what type of theories, uh, what type of random matrices in fact give you echoes. And there's a generic class of random matrices that do give you echoes. So that's, that's where the echoes are. Okay, so... Um, we could get echoes in care CFD. Uh, care CFD is another version of holography in a one plus one dimension. And this one is not very surprising. You can get echoes because if you, basically you have a field theory in a circle. So what goes around comes around. And uh, so this, I'm not gonna tell you about any details, but uh, we basically built a uh, basic structure on top of uh, this hidden conform symmetry of care black holes and show that they lead generically to echoes. Uh, Boltzmann echoes. In fact. Um, you could get echoes from fuzzball. So this is a recent paper by uh, Ikeda and collaborators. And uh, this is these are special fuzzball solutions, not the most generic ones. But indeed, as it is a quantum theory, a quantum model, model black holes. And you could see that you see these spaced echoes in these models. Uh, the problem is that these are not like the real black holes we see in nature, so it's hard to actually connect these results to observables. But nevertheless, this is a generic prediction. Uh, all models of quantum black holes uh, should give you echoes, in fact, and I'm going to emphasize this again. In fact, what the reason that all models of quantum black holes should give you echoes is that if you don't have echoes, basically, if you take classical general relativity and you look at inside the angular momentum barrier, it turns out that if Hawking was correct, it fills up with Hawking radiation. But this is an infinite range. You know, this, 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 uh, this distance, the total square root goes to minus infinity. Uh, so you get infinite entropy of Hawking radiation that fills up inside the angular momentum barrier in classical general relativity. So if you want the finite entropy for black holes, which is, uh, uh, which is what? Hawking, in fact, uh, first proposed as well, about Beckoness thing, and then uh, Hawking endorsed that as well. Uh, is so even though in general relativity there are no echoes, things that just go in and don't come out. For finite entropy, you need to cut off this radiation somewhere. Uh, so there must be some quantum for something that cuts off this radiation so that you get a finite entropy. And you could show that based on that, if you do make that a finite entropy then there would be a time scale because things get somewhere and then come back. And the time scale is proportional to log of that entropy. It depends on angular momentum because the bigger L, the higher this angular momentum barrier, the faster things come back. But it's basically exactly the same formula I, told, I showed you before. So, um, so basically, and, and uh, yeah, that leads to echoes if you cut this off somewhere. So if you believe in quantum mechanics, and if you believe that black holes have a finite entropy, which I mean, all finite quantum systems should have finite entropy in quantum mechanics, um, then, uh, then there must be echoes. And in fact, I can push it even harder and or farther and say that echoes to LIGO, it's like Higgs to LHC or what Higgs was to LHC. There was no guarantee that it would have been observed, but if you took the principles of quantum mechanics, 
something should have happened at those scales where uh, basically LHC was looking. And Higgs was the simplest ex explanation. Uh, and basically, you could kind of follow the same logic, but unitarity, effective field theory. But instead, basically, instead of gauge symmetries of a star model, you should use gauge symmetries of uh, gravity. And then uh, you actually expect something like echoes, because otherwise, basically, all these arguments I told you, uh, which relied on quantum mechanics breakdown. So, um, so let me uh, stop here and ask whether there are any questions. Uh, uh, Nayesh, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Hi, Morgan. Um, yeah, hi, how's it going? Um, uh, also, first of all, amazing talk. I'm just very excited to hear this uh, the, uh, about these this echo paper that you guys have put out. Um, uh, I had a couple of quick questions. Um, so you have uh, uh, a reflection of a gravitational wave off of some sort of horizon surface that comes out, and this is a stimulated Hawking effect, right? Is the, do yes, you have that... any sort of uh, so and and you have the and the way you look at these things is to see the same waveform which is then reflected from this echo, right? Do you see any sort of thermality from this thing? Is the information being scrambled? Is it being burned off in some way, or is it the exact same waveform that's coming out in the? It's echo? not this. Uh, it's, it's it's not so. so I, I'm going to show you a little bit more about what the waveform looks like. But uh, basically, what it comes from is you, you cannot exactly predict it because you have to do a, a numerical simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you make a, basically a couple of assumptions, one is basically the size of the cavity which is basically given by the entropy, which is what I'm showing here. And the other is this Boltzmann reflectivity, yeah. which is, I told you, anytime something hits, basically in a frequency dependent way, uh, it comes out. And th those two are based on thermodynamics, these two assumptions, like the fact that the entropy is uh, what it is, and the fact that reflection is what it is, they're both, uh, both uh, is a Boltzmann reflectivity. They both uh, are based on thermodynamics. But of course, this is not a thermal system, you have two merging black holes. It is a very non-equilibrium, non-thermal system. So, so you learn something from thermality, but then apply it to the non-thermal uh, system. And uh, there you have to kind of uh, fudge things a little bit and say that basically you, want it, you expect to see the general relativity at first, mm -hmm. uh, and then whatever new effects should follow. Uh, and with that assumption, we could make waveforms, right? Okay. Uh, but I should emphasize that uh, we are kind of, it's, it's the Frankenstein kind of thing is that you're, you're mixing general relativity, which is very non-equilibrium for the early behavior with this uh, thermal assumptions for the late time behavior. And then try to kind of mix them as a smoothly or match them as a smoothly as possible. Uh, but, but since we don't have a coherent picture that could be quantum and thermal throughout the entire evolution, it's not an entirely, um, I mean, no one has been able to do it entirely self-consistently. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to show you some attempts that kind of do it more concretely than what we did. But yeah, so that's that's the idea, right? Okay. And then if I could just one quick uh, follow up. Uh, sure. So you you have the uh, um, you did the QED analysis for the similar type of effect, which was a specifically a quantum calculation, and then. Yeah. You, you were able to demonstrate, if you just like switch the, the ratio of the couplings to the gravitational coupling, you get the same result. Um, yeah. And so there's there's that, at the same time, there's the uh, the fluid analog with the stimulated uh, Hawking radiation yep. there, yep. which that is classical. And, and so do you, do you think that this is a purely uh, a purely quantum effect or a classical effect, or what do you think about that? And No, the, um, the fluid picture is also a quantum. The fluid picture is also quantum. Even uh, with because... water, not with the BC? Uh, I mean, you, you were talking about a stimulated talking radiation. So if you have a stimulated uh, radiation, then it's, I mean, the amplitude is large, but it's, um, okay. yeah, I mean, I'm, it, it depends on what you mean by quantum. I mean, the nature of this yeah, is the yeah, quantum yeah. effect, but, but it is a large, uh, it, yeah. So you don't get it as a perturbation of general relativity. Um, Right. Even so. So again. So it's not. It's not classical in the sense that it's not a perturbation of general relativity, but it's classical in the sense that it's large amplitude. So the amplitude is big. So, if, but you cannot get it. It's a very non-perturbative uh, quantum effects. You may. You may argue. Okay. Uh, cool. But in fact, this is not new. This. I mean, in fact, all the stimulated effects can be like that. If you have large classical condensates, they uh, they lead to uh, a stimulated emission. 
Okay. I think I wonder whether I should move on. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, okay. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. we can we can discuss more. Uh, I think Sayak had a question as well. Yeah, yeah. I have a question uh, that um, have you checked like when the Boltzmann reflectivity is coming, whether the QNM frequency itself of the black holes get shifted. Yeah, so it's actually very interesting. Uh, so uh, as soon as you introduce this membrane, the, all, the, all the old quantum uh, quasi normal modes just disappear. You have a new, completely different tower of quasi normal modes. Um, so, so it's in actually this is related to the recent discussion using the spectrum that quasi normal modes are not stable. Uh, but basically, it goes to the fact that the quasi normal modes themselves are not necessarily observable. Uh, you could get, um, I mean, the same waveform, very similar waveforms, but very different quasi normal mode spectra because it depends on how you excite them. Uh, but in fact, this is what happens is that even though the waveform could look very, the same, very much the same for a very long time, uh, you completely get rid of GR quantum quasi normal modes and you just have this new tower of quasi normal modes that are trapped between these. Uh, these so, therefore, so, therefore, in that sense, whatever the quasi normal mode we have observed yet, they are, if the, the if this phenomenon is already happening, then the quasi normal modes we have seen are already this kind of quasi normal modes. Now, no, 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 it, can, it actually, is it the, it, it's not true. Basically, uh, the, the quasi normal modes that are seen are that they assume that there is a single mode um, and then they fit for it. But of course, what happens is that when you get these echoes, you, you excite like a hundred of these modes at the same time. So initially, it looks like that you have just uh, one GR uh, ring down, which is, let me just show you, I guess I'll show you something. Uh, let me just show you an example of this again. Um, in fact, actually, I had, I had an example of it right, right here. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so you see this GR ring down here. Um, so in fact, you could make this just from a single decaying quasi normal mode, or you could uh, look at the superposition of like 50 or 100 of the modes of this cavity, uh, the modes of this cavity, uh, you could superpose 50 of them and reconstruct exactly the same thing, uh, which looks exactly the same as this until the echoes start. So basically this idea, there is no unique uh, mapping between, especially if you have a finite time, you cannot uniquely map. And is, this is also well known. You cannot uniquely map a ring down may from to a quasi normal mode spectrum, right? Uh, that's, oh, so this is a e can. Mm -hmm. oh, so therefore actually echo has to be observed to really, this can, to really comment on that. Yes, well, that's right, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you really have to compare the waveforms, right? That's uh, that's my that's really. I mean, that's an, uh, just purely observational uh, statement, right? I mean, even if you forget about echo story, uh, if you see a waveform, there is no unique way of decomposing it into uh, uh, quasi normal modes. Um, it, it's, it's also well known. In fact, it's it's well known in observation uh, observational analysis that this is not unique. If you have finite data, so so really you have you want to match the waveforms, not not the quasi normal mode spectrum. But we could talk about this in fact later. So uh, do I have uh, ten minutes now? Is that right? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Ten minutes. Okay, thanks, uh, Sayak. I don't know if that answers uh, that your question. So yeah, yeah I got the answer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. Okay. So uh, the final 10 minutes, I want to tell you, so I told you this a story about what quantum black holes should look like, and in particular, advocate why, if you believe in quantum mechanics, you should believe in echoes. Um, but then let me tell you, okay, so where does this uh, kind of belief or this, uh, de these derivations from quantum mechanics, where do they meet physics? So where fantasy and physics, in fact, meet each other. Meet each other. So uh, first we, in fact, this was the first time I ever did anything on black holes uh, with uh, two, uh, in fact, I had two, two students, uh, Jai Dabadi, who was a visiting PhD student at Perimeter, and Hannah Dykar, who was a visiting undergraduate student. We looked at um, um, whether you could look, uh, find some kind of replicates of the original ring down that repeat as echoes. And there was zero uh, GR involved. We just, it was just pure data analysis and we didn't really know uh, how these echoes should look like. This was shortly, uh, like a few months after LIGO originally 
released its result. It was in 2016. Uh, and we nobody knew how these echoes should look like. So we kind of made up something as best as we, we could have guessed, and then look for some evidence. But the important thing is, in fact, we had to combine all the evidence, all the events that were released by LIGO. There were three events, basically, uh, 15 or 9, 14, and then there was an LVT event and the Boxing Day events. So when we combined them, we, we found evidence for echoes. This is weak uh, as around 1% p-value, uh, which is I mean, two and a half sigma. So it's far from a detection, but it's something that's in tentative evidence. Uh, but we had to combine the three events. And this is something that most people fail to do. They just look at the events one by one. But if you don't, you have to combine them to actually something, to see something significant. And even then, it's not terribly significant. So it, the significance is not very low. Incidentally, uh, Hannah's mother, who was my colleague, uh, went on to win the Nobel Prize uh, in physics two years later. So she certainly did, does have good pedigree. Um, um so, uh, so um now going back to the result that we found in it it turns out that anyone who tried to reproduce it reproduced it so this is an example of a LIGO of a team that is uh, uh part, part of LIGO collaboration uh it's not the LIGO paper but it's part of LIGO collaboration but basically they they use the same methodology that we did and uh they looked for combining uh, different events and then they found a p-value of 2%, which in fact is 2% plus or minus 5%, and we, we reported a p-value of 1%. And that's that's basically what, uh, two, uh, this is kind of the range of p-values you have. So they were, they were consistent, and this is around um, two and a half sigma, as I said. In fact, if you look at the first two events, it's, it was 0.4%, which is a three sigma uh, evidence. However, the problem already appear clear, became clear at that point that somehow some events don't show evidence for echoes, but others do. And we don't really know why. It's either that just the whole thing was a, a statistical fluke, or maybe not all events are supposed to have echoes. I mean, maybe they are, they are fainter in some events and brighter in others, and we just don't know, just as well as we don't know how they look, how, how bright they should be. Uh, they could be brighter in some and fainter in others. So, um, so indeed, our result was reproduced. And there have been other uh, reproductions. So this is a, another uh, team that was part of LIGO collaboration. And they used a, a method that is widely used by LIGO, known as coherent wave burst. And they found for these two events, uh, we, uh, they found echoes at 0.2 and 0.1 second, uh, which was exactly the same time that we computed from the formula I presented to you uh, for these two events. Uh, so if you take the parameters of those two events. So these, these are the times that come from Planck scale structure near uh, horizon or from uh, a scrambling time. And these are the time scale that these guys, uh, these gentlemen found. Uh, and this is what they found. Basically they look at the uh, frequency time domain from uh, this is using CWB method. And they found the signals that follow the main event. And, and the p-values again were between 0.1% to 1%. And you could also compute, uh, so this is the main event. These are the possible echoes. And you could also show that this is analysis we did uh, kind of precisely that the, the, the position in the sky for the echoes and the main event seem to coincide with each other more or less though. So the base factor, the, it seems that they're not exactly in the same place, but in fact, the base factor for coincidence is five. So that means that they're more likely to be the same as opposed to different. Uh, the, the answer is, is model dependent. You could see here, there is no unique way of doing risk reconstruction of echoes because there's, there, is, uh, there is a model, some model dependence there, but none, nonetheless, this is the model agnostic way of doing this. So, um, so I should warn you that this is going to get a little bit complex. So if you want to tune out, that's okay, because essentially there are a lot of different people who looked at it and then got different results. So I'm just going to tell you that the, the takeaway from the next five minutes is that it's just complicated. Uh, and the answer depends on how you do it. So this is an example from a Japanese group that use the same method that we did, but for the O2 events, and they got a p-value of 
Uh, now, they did the other analysis with different waveforms in their paper, and that one didn't uh, show anything. But in fact, if you use the same uh, same waveform that we use for O1 and then apply it to O2, then you get also a, a relatively small p-value, which is around 4%. This is another group, uh, Bob Holdham uh, from University of Toronto, and he claims to have seen evidence for echoes in all these events at relatively small p-values, and they're all consistent with the time scale you expect from basically the formula I showed you. This eta uh, in the model I showed you should be two. He claimed it's not exactly two, but they're all consistent somewhere around 1.7. So, um, so that's, that's, that's basically this result. Uh, we looked at binary neutral star events and then showed that uh, it seems that after one second, there is some evidence for echoes uh, by looking at particular, basically, things that repeat at 72 hertz and multiples of 72 hertz. Um, and if you uh, if you look at uh, all the Kelsper effect, it was a four sigma evidence. It turns out, in fact, turns out this one second, uh, and this is an independent analysis, they also uh, found Gilatol that that's when you expect to form a black hole after the formation, after the uh, merger of the two neutron stars. So I, while no one else actually have tried to reproduce our result here um, in, the, in this particular methodology that we use, in fact, the electromagnetic observation suggests that the black hole forms exactly when we see the echoes. Because of course, for this particular event, the, you expect to see the echoes when the black holes form. And after that, you're going to show the see the echoes quickly. Now we don't know. There could be something else happening here uh, as well. It doesn't. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of um, astrophysics happening in this problem, so this doesn't necessarily have to be echoes. And uh, the last analysis I want to show you is uh, the one that's most recent, where we actually had a very specific template because now this is uh, five years later. And we actually have perfected, we have this model for quantum black holes based on both kind of reflectivity uh, and, and the time scale, uh, a scrambling time. So we have a much better understanding of quantum black holes since, uh, well, for, uh, since five years ago. And we, we know the time scale and we know the frequency at which you should see these echoes. And then we, there seems to be that in the spectrum, uh, spectrogram, there seems to be uh, hints of these echoes. And then we could use a CWB method again that I showed you, a coherent wave burst method to look for echoes. And then this is the same plot I showed you for a different event. And this is now for 1905-21. This event is the biggest black hole ever seen by LIGO and in fact has the loudest ring down ever. So if you want to, if you can't see echoes anywhere, it should be here because it has the loudest ring down. And indeed we see something with p-value of around 0.5%. So, so this is kind of, this is what you see here. And you could compare the Boltzmann best fit waveforms from Pi CBC, uh, which is a basic a Monte Carlo Markov chain method. And then the, the CWB, uh, and they seem that at least for the first echo, they seem to be more or less consistent. Uh, the second echo, uh, it seems that CWB doesn't pick it up uh, because it, CWB only picks up things that are very loud. Now, I should warn you uh, that not everyone sees the echoes, uh, and these are ex examples from LIGO collaboration. But also, I should warn you that they, uh, they use models that have much more free parameters, so they have a, a much harder time finding things that are faint. Uh, so if you don't know what you're looking for, this is the way to go. But as LIGO team themselves, let me tell you, they have these template banks, Benson GR, that are better in finding GR events. And uh, if you think you understand echoes from a quantum model of black holes, then that seems to me a more promising way than these methods that don't have any model. And in particular, in fact, for this last event I showed you, somehow these analyses are all missing this event, GW 1905 Either they just look at a very short time, 0.5 second, even though echoes here are at one second. And then this one altogether misses that event. So somehow the most promising event is missing from LIGO analysis. So um, this is a summary of 
the st state of art, so there are some groups that find evidence for echoes that are about, uh, I mean, 5% or lower p-values. And there are some groups that uh, look for it and don't find it. Uh, and there could be different reasons for it, but basically it seems that some events don't seem to have echoes and then some templates cannot pick echoes, but then others seem, seem to be able to do. So the status is complicated. And uh, one way to understand it, uh, why, uh, why different methods disagree is basically, if you imagine a larger space of echo, uh, echo models, you have uh, our models that are like Boltzmann search uh, that are physically informed priors. And then you have these model agnostic or model independent searches that look at basically everywhere here, uh, which is a larger space. And the way that Bayesian analysis work is that you basically look at the evidence where you see echoes divided by the, uh, all the places that you don't see. And um, basically uh, all these places where you don't find things, then they, they, uh, they penalize you, basically you're penalized the most base factor. So, so it could be the same events, uh, but uh, if you just, you have a much bigger prior, is a hundred times bigger, you know, base factors are going to be a hundred times smaller, even though you might be seeing the same event. So you may go from a strong event to a negative evidence if you just have a very large prior. And that's what happens if you have model independent searches, which uh, don't use the physics that we expect uh, for that, that motivate echoes. Um, now, the future is bright. This is, this is in fact, again, hot off the presses just uh, three days ago. In fact, this is uh, Ching Wen Wang, so my PhD student, who, in fact, uh, first uh, was one of the people who pioneered the Boltzmann uh, Echo idea. So uh, she then collaborated with Yan Bei Chen and Mark Shi and her group in, and his group in Caltech to uh, try to make a hybrid model for, uh, for new Boltzmann Echoes, or just, yeah, Boltzmann Echoes from numerical relativity. So they have basically somehow matched numerical relativity uh, and uh, PPN, and, uh, PPN analysis and Tukowski equation, uh, and you could look at their papers for the details. But this is the kind of waveform they get for this uh, particular numerical uh, merger. This is like the first event that LIGO saw, and this is their echo. And for both echoes or stimulated Hawking radiation, which is this line, uh, for this particular event, the signal to noise for LIGO is less, to, is less than one, they predict. But then for Cosmic Explorer, it's going to be more than 10. So the future is bright. So let me conclude. And this is, this is the number. So conclusion, I think we are still fighting Einstein's demons in his Great War. So even though First World War is over, uh, Einstein's Great War and his demons are not yet over. One battleground is the quantum nature of black holes. Now, saying that there are no echoes is like saying that there is no quantum mechanics, or somehow black holes don't obey the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, so, I I think that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and in particular, exactly what you expect to see if if there are echoes, uh, I I presented an argument for you that a stimulated Hawking radiation gives you logarithmically delay, delayed echoes at horizon frequency. Uh, so there's tantalizing but controversial hints for echoes, and I could, but we might have possible first measurement of a stimulated talking radius. Okay, thanks a lot.